everybody, you're listening to Sit Down with Stand Ups. I'm Ari Azizian, and my guest today is the very, very funny and talented Rachel McDowell. It just takes some time, a little girl, and a little out the right. Everything, everything will be just fine. Everything, everything will be alright, alright. Where are you from originally? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. You yeah. said it in your act, I heard you're from a small town yeah. in Pennsylvania. Pe- Indiana, Pennsylvania. Indiana, Pennsylvania. Which is, okay. Uh, Jimmy Stewart's hometown. Oh, and, really? Yeah. And oh, the wow. Christmas tree capital of the world. But I think there are about like nine Christmas tree capitals of the world. That's but. awesome. <laughs> yeah. So cool. Did you have a job out there like at the Christmas tree like no. area? I didn't ever know. That's an interesting question. I never knew anybody that farmed Christmas trees. <laughs> I never knew anybody that sold Christmas trees. It was just, it was just something. It was a sign. Yeah. It was just on a sign that you'd pass at Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> and how long were you there for? Before I grew you, up there. You so, grew up there. Yeah. So I was there. For the, until I went to college, which I went to college close by. Okay. Um, and then I stayed in Pennsylvania until I was about 27. Which college you go to over there? It's called Clarion. Clarion University Clarion of Pennsylvania. University. Okay. Cup. And then you did business and? <laughs> no, I did uh, communications and art history was my. Oh, cool. Yeah. And well, I. What was the art history? Did you do some art yourself or was it just like an no, interest? I didn't know any. I, I didn't. I don't think I knew much about anything, to tell you the truth, outside of the walls of Indiana County. Right. And even there, I just showed you I didn't know much because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know where any of the Christmas well, trees how small were. How was the town? Like, um, like sixteen thousand people. Oh my gosh! Mm-hmm. In your high school graduate plus, class. Plus, plus a university, a really well-respected university that's about sixteen thousand people. No, too. Clarion. No, Indiana University Indiana. of Pennsylvania. Okay. Got it. So Indiana is Indiana because the county is shaped like the state of Indiana. Oh, so, really? Yeah, oh, that's so, so cool. Not very creative, but, <laughs> but there's a great like Indiana, university. Let's just call it <laughs> Yeah. And how, how big was your like, graduating class from high like school? 380-ish. Oh, God, that's really small, yeah. Dude, what did compared to what? I think we had like 700 or 800 oh, yeah. or something uh-uh. like Yeah, it was huge LA public school. But. I never thought about that. Like I, my friends now are, everybody moved away and they've all moved back to Pittsburgh oh, or really? the area. Yeah. And my friends were picking like the best school in Pittsburgh, but the graduating class was like 900. And they're like, we're not sending our kid to that. Like <laughs> they went, that's, it seems so overwhelming yeah. to me. <laughs> well, I'm so interested because like Pittsburgh and all that's around there. So it's like pretty blue collar, like very, kind of a town. Yeah. Yes. Very blue collar kind of town. And did you like have an interest in stand up when you were in high school or growing no, up? No, not at all. Um, so I didn't know what I wanted to do. And you would ask art history was sort of my, uh, And this is something I always wanted to turn into a bit, but I haven't. But when I, like, I had no idea really about anything. And (laughs) so I thought I was, like, I remember waiting to get into colleges or waiting to apply to colleges. And I thought it was going to be, like, Vanessa Huxtable. (laughs) Like, when Vanessa (laughs) Huxtable... When she like she had colleges that she just had to get into and she was dying to get into. And I kept waiting for that to happen. And I knew I didn't want to go to Indiana. I didn't want to go to IUP. I always thought that was, like, 13th grade. And then I had no, I didn't know, I had no idea where I wanted to go to school. Um, so I didn't have a Vanessa Huxtable moment and I didn't know what I was going to do. <laughs> I remember so. she had all the sweaters and like everything. She was like so pre-planned and thought out. <laughs> I love that you know that. Yeah. She was so excited. Yeah. And she'd run to the, the door in the, the mailbox. Was it Columbia that she was trying to get into or something? Well, Heathcliff went to, where did Vanessa, and then it's a different world. Oh God. I don't even know. Cosby Show references. But they all went to the same place, but I don't right. know where Vanessa went. But They're they all, all very studious. And yeah. The spinoff was all go to Heathcliff's alma mater, I thought. <laughs> but <laughs> So you had no idea what you wanted to do, Correct. and you got into Clarion, right? Correct. Okay. And it was a teacher's school, teacher's so I was school, like, okay. I guess I'll be a teacher. Yeah. And then I just, I maybe I was um, early special ed, and all my friends were, everybody was a teacher, and I remember not being very impressed at school like I just remember thinking like I think my grammar is getting worse like I just remember (laughs) thinking college was gonna be so much more difficult than it was and then I took an art history course and it was hard like I loved my professor and it was like my brain hurt and uh, and certainly I I I did have a great education there but art history was what made me really think and study and it's like all the dates and like baroque period and And learning about the history that happened that created the art and I just loved it um that's and I was, so I wrote the bit was when I told my grandpa, like it took me about a year to really figure out what I wanted to do. And I like came home and I was like, grandpa, I realized what I'm going to do. I'm going to major in communications and I'm going to minor in art history. <laughs> and he was like, so basically what you're telling me is you're going to major in unemployment and minor in welfare. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't get it. History, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. that extra makes, that's so funny. 
And then, so was it there that you sort of, I mean, when did the oh, comedy, comedy sort of come in? Um, was it much later after college? Yeah. So I graduated college yeah. and I was very depressed. Like I thought that was the other moment that oh, I no. thought I would wait for Like, yeah. I'm going to have all these job offers and I'm going to make like 30 grand a year, <laughs> <laughs> which in Pittsburgh is almost livable. That's right. a good, but, um, and then nothing. I had no skills. I had no trade. Um, and I, and I got a job, but I got my dream job. Um, I had interned at the Andy Warhol Museum oh in Pittsburgh. Oh my gosh, that's right. awesome. It yeah. was wonderful. And then I got a job at the Carnegie Museum of Art, which is the big, it, right. Yeah, that's incredible. It was incredible, and I hated every second of it. Oh, and no. I, yeah. <laughs> and I made um, 20000 comma $500 a year. And, <laughs> uh, but so it was my dream job, but yeah. I like lived. Why did you hate it? Well, one, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't afford to do anything anything yeah on that like I and I lived at home and I still couldn't afford to do anything and um it was just sort of like I was an assistant and then there was director there was nowhere to move so right. you're the lowest man on the totem pole or the biggest man on the totem pole <laughs> you don't really and have there, an option right there was just a huge gap and it was just people were brilliant but they didn't make money like they would in the corporate world so it was a power struggle a lot with like these brilliant the big guys could be kind of mean sometimes yeah and, um and I just thought, like, God, I don't want to, I would rather give to charities than work for one. Like, right. if I'm going to spend all my time and energy, like, working like working in a nonprofit and making these salaries, like, I want to give kids shoes, not send Lulu to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, yeah. um, but, like, with so comedy, intercomedy, I, I worked in specifically the Museum of Art, but the Institute had multiple museums. And I had to go over to the main office one day and there were girls that I knew, but I probably worked with saw in person five times a year. Yeah. And like, this is where like the fates, I think sometimes like the <laughs> stars align and I had to drop off an envelope at one of the girls desks. And she was like, listen, Mara. And I don't remember her name where they're making me take the stand up comedy class at the CCAC, the community college. Oh, man. I don't want to do it. Please. Will you do it with me? And I was like, sure. That's awesome. Yeah. And I didn't have, I couldn't afford it. It was $30 for <laughs> <laughs> six classes. And uh, so my brother paid was it for it. By? Was it taught by like another comedian? It was taught by a comedian that was not at all respected in the Pittsburgh scene. I never saw him do a stage time. I yeah. never crossed paths with him. And I did comedy in Pittsburgh for a while or was at least going to shows. Right. He was probably mo the most unrespected person, <laughs> but he did a class at the community college. And What was the class like? Fun, fun. Like fun and it was um like i like the, uh, there was a toilet salesman and like like the, just the variety of human beings and we all had this one common bond which is still one of my favorite things about comedy where yeah. it's like oh this guy and i would never be friends but we can talk for hours and hours and hours because of that comedy bond right that's true yeah yeah and that was it like i remember like i'm still in touch with the toilet salesman however <laughs> no many way. years later sure <laughs> and, and you're still doing comedy too I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, every once in a while. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And so. the class was just like in the community college, there was like a microphone set up in no, a classroom. No, a podium. Right? It was no, a podium. I don't even know if there was any microphone on the podium, but he taught us how to rant. So you had to pick a topic and rant. And just and, go. Yeah. And I had, um, one of my best friends had crazy uncles that in high school we all made fun of. So I did, like, I made fun of the uncles and, um, like, oh, my big, pretty girl. They were Southern, <laughs> Southern guys. You're getting so tall. Like, that was something like that. And then we had a final, and it was at, like, a steak restaurant. Oh, my god! But it was all friends and family. Yeah. And so um, it was all friends and family. And then and I killed, or so I thought. And, and then it gave me something to talk about. Like, so I was in, like, I call it my blue phase, which is a little art history reference. <laughs> Pretty much the only thing I get from that background. <laughs> but it wasn't like blue, dirty comedy. Was no, it, it was oh, okay. blue, sad. Picasso had a pink phase right. where things were going well and a blue phase where things were going really lousy. Okay. In my museum years were my blue phase. <laughs> Um, but finally, so like, were you just ranting about how, like how working at the museum and oh, like, I don't think so. I don't know what I ranted about. Pro I don't know. Traffic or whatever yeah. a new comic rants about, but I, uh, but I had nothing going on in my life. And this gave me, like, people got so excited about it mm -hmm. and people wanted to know about it and people wanted to brag about it. So it was like, okay. Um, and then I did a class. There was a funny bone in Pittsburgh and sadly it's oh. not there anymore. But I did a class and part of the class was you had to 
um, you then got to open for a real live headliner, like a real oh, live wow. headliner yeah. on, on like a Tuesday. That's so cool. But it was a big deal. Like, yeah. so you, like at the time now I can, that would be nothing to me, but Who's now the real time or big time headliner. Um, Mark Eddy was the guy. Oh, wow. Do really? you know Mark Eddy? Yeah. Excellent. I love that's Mark great. Eddy. Yeah. yeah <laughs> so good. Funny. I didn't mean to ask like with a question mark. Of course. No. That's great. Yeah. That's awesome. But so it was Mark Eddy. Yeah. And, uh, did you get to choose or was it just like, well, um, so we got a list of weekends and I was scared out of my mind. I didn't want to do it again. So I picked the absolute last weekend. So let's say I took the class in May and I picked October to do my Tuesday night. Okay. And I did, uh, and I went and Mark Eddy is the kindest. Have you ever met him? No. Okay. So he is exactly what he seems like on stage, really? oh, wow. but nicer even. And he's so <laughs> nice for those of you that don't know the rock and comic Mark Eddy. Um, that's his website, but he was wonderful and it, oh awesome. baby yeah. you're the best you're so good and he just like riddled me with compliments and I come back this weekend and my agent's gonna be here and i would really? never even wow. heard the word agent yeah. before and i did a bit that i wrote that day on the trolley there and uh and i used that bit for probably five years wow. like it ended up being my opener which is a very your most That's important awesome. joke yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then we went out and we partied and we drank and it was just, That's I had incredible. this sense of community and it was like, this is the really, really cool way to yeah. live. Like, I want to do this again. This is showbiz. <laughs> this is showbiz in Pittsburgh and Station Square. And it was so, great. So is that the funny bone? Yep. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. And Mark Eddy's like the funniest guy. Like, he's one, he's from Dayton, Ohio. So he's from nearby. That's and, amazing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He was so kind and, wow. and, and, and he's sort of my guardian angel of comedy. So there'll be times when I want to quit. Or where I don't do comedy for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Not so much anymore, but through the years. Yeah. And I remember well, I moved from Pittsburgh to San Francisco. And, and then I probably, like, I got intimidated. And I took about a year off thinking, like, well, maybe I was just supposed to move to San Francisco and then right. live a life and not do comedy. And the same thing happened when I moved here. I moved here, still had the day job. Was like, maybe I was just supposed to move <laughs> to Los Angeles. <laughs> like, maybe I'm not supposed it's to do this. It's terrifying. Yeah. But I remember the one day I woke up and it was like, all right, Rachel, you don't have to do this anymore. Right. Like I finally, I had been battling my head and it was like, all right, you're off the hook. And I drove, I lived right in West Hollywood and I drove and I drove past the improv and Mark Eddy was on the marquee oh, wow, and it yeah. was like, ah, oh, and that's happened like many times you where it's pass cross and it's like, fate. like that's yeah. fate. Yeah. Like, so I went that night to see Mark and, and I was like, all right, I can't, so I cool. can't quit this. What is that battle that you say when you go from. A t you, know, you know to a new town and you're just like it's so intimidating because I know that feeling but I don't really know how to like put it in words kind of I think so in Pittsburgh I was I was a beyond an open micer so we didn't have that many comedians I was um hosting that point at the at the improv so I jumped ship from punchline oh, and went cool, to improv yeah. and uh and then punch uh, I'm sorry not punchline funny bone so I left the funny bone went to the improv Mark took me to the improv so Sweet. that was a big fancy moment in my yeah. life um, but the funny bone at that point, you couldn't, I couldn't even go have a drink in the bar. Like if it was like, if you cross this in here, I'm like, I forgot two jokes. Like oh, what, really? what do they like care about me? Kind of? Well, the improv wasn't aware of the rivalry. It was the just funny the bone funny was, bone. Okay. Yeah. Sort of like Los Angeles and San Francisco, how San Franciscans hate right. Los Angeles. And, and has no idea. No idea. They're like, it's a beautiful place. We go wine tasting. It's right. great. It's like that. <laughs> um, I forget your question. Well, I mean the battle, I mean, is it? Just oh, coming battle. to a place where you have to restart all over again. Kind yeah. Of? And it's it's going in and like feeling like I knew what I was doing. Right. Realizing I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't as good as I thought I was. San Francisco is an amazing spot for comedians. And then having to reintroduce myself like that was the one thing right. like it pained me because I was like sort of in a very small pond. I was a good sized fish. And here I wasn't even a fish like I was a tadpole, tadpole oh. under a rock. <laughs> And like I'd meet these guys five times and then they would look at me as though they'd never seen me before. And it was like, what? And I just, it made me mad. Yeah. And I remember Moshe Kasher, you know Moshe Kasher? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I remember like introducing myself to him and he was finally was like, I know who you are. Oh. And it meant the world. And like he'll always have a place in my heart. Because I, like, I, I had just like succumbed to like, oh, these guys don't pay any attention to me. And it was fine. Like, it was so kind of him to be like, I know who you are. I've Aww. met you before. Yeah. I was like, oh, thanks, man. And that, I, that was a turning point for me. Like, all right. I'm okay. back in it. Like, oh, I, yeah, yeah, sort of. And, um, but it's just, it's in, the, in San Francisco, the comedy is so, it's a little bit more cerebral, I think. Right. 
They say it's a comedy cradle, so it's a great place to hone your craft, to get really good at your craft. Then you come to Los Angeles or New York. And that was one of the other turning points when I realized the best of the best leave. So I was like, oh, there's always room at the top in San Francisco. Right. So that kind of gave me hope versus here where the best of the best continue to come. I say. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they set up camp and they're here constantly. Right. And then, yeah, they come from different countries and they're all... <laughs> But Just San Francisco, it was like, okay, so I could climb to that ladder. Right. And I remember thinking punchline. So in San Francisco, you get a punchline every Sunday. And you did you do like this? Year, right? Yeah, like every Sunday mm-hmm. for a year. Yeah. No, I remember you- talking to you about it, though. You like told me like all about it and I was like oh my gosh like I had no idea. Yeah. You explained everything to me before. Oh good was- yeah. So it's just a long process. Right. And you and I hated it. I just and I felt like I was the dork and this was the cool kids table and you'd see the cool kids that walk in they're like hey what's up dude? How yeah, you doing? Super yeah. yeah and they're real <laughs> confident and you're, I'm looking at my shoes and I remember one day being like you know like I'm not a dork I never was a dork and then I'm just not gonna go. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> so I didn't go for a lot of Sundays. And, uh, but then I did like Rooster Teeth Feathers and Sunnyvale oh, cool, and yeah. Tommy T's and I felt confident there. Like I, I think I'm not, I don't think I'm a cerebral comic. I'm not going <laughs> to talk to you about politics right. and then twist you on your, oh my God, I never looked at the world that way. I'm not <laughs> that person. Who, were, who was headlining around that time when you were waiting at the punchline? Um, who were like the big? So who were the big, the big locals that left? Uh, I'm embarrassed. I'm forgetting his name. Ryan Stout was one of the first oh, people wow, I met. Yeah. So Ryan Stout pretty much left as I got there. So about the same year. But I, he was the one that made me see like, oh, okay, they leave. <laughs> yeah. That's great. And Moshe, Moshe, Moshe was there. probably the first year and a half, he was becoming a big dog, was a big dog. Chris Garcia, okay, wow, Caitlin yeah. Gill. Like, well, th- those guys, Caitlin was sort of my school. Brendan Lynch, um, Emily Heller, who's oh, wow, done yeah. big things. Um, Those guys were all up there at the same time? Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. And would you go to the uh, Purple Onion, too? Yeah. That was yeah. still around? Yeah. I love the Purple oh, Onion. Oh, so cool. That was, a, that was a big deal, too. I think my first time there, I was headlining, but it was like wow. a Tuesday night or something yeah. like that. But that was a big, big deal for people that don't know. That's where they filmed, like, the first, the Smothers Brothers yeah. uh, comedy album. And, uh, Didn't, like, Richard Pryor, George Carlin, one of those guys go down there? I know, I'm probably. Something like, yeah. One the Smothers Brothers and, and Zach Galifianakis yeah. are who... Uh, yeah, Zach's <laughs> whole special is there. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I love that place. And I mean, how long were you in Pittsburgh before you went to San Francisco? Like how were you like a middle in Pittsburgh? So I was probably just about to become a middle okay. in my head. I think I was about to become a middle. Yeah. So I lie, you know, like women lie about their age and I lie about my comedy age <laughs> because there's so many gaps. Right. Um, so let's say if I were being honest, let's say I discovered comedy maybe 14 years ago. Okay. I don't know, maybe a little longer than that. And then, you know, you, like you'll take a year off or you do like one show every right. three months. Right. So I kind of clock my comedy career to 2007 when I moved to San Francisco. Okay. So, so that's when I started to take it more seriously. And then when you get to San Francisco, you kind of have to start all over again. Mm-hmm. But you already have like, you know, a bunch of great material, right? So like. I thought. It, oh, so well, when you got there, did you have to like, did you realize that? You didn't have as much as you thought you did or like I think it's different. So in Pittsburgh, I think the guys that I worked with, the big dogs in Pittsburgh, yeah. never changed their material or very rarely changed their material. So I kind of that's the school I came up in. Get some good jokes and do them all the right. time and who cares? Wasn't Dom Herrera also a Pittsburgh guy? Oh, I don't no? think so. No, I worked okay. with him at Punchline. Oh you did, yeah. I wonder, I'll ask him. I don't think so. He's definitely East Coast. Yeah. Oh, Jersey or something. Right. Philly, maybe Philly. Philly. Yeah, that's, that's it. what it is. That's completely same state, but could not be two it's different. Totally opposite. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like Philly is East Coast. I say I'm East Coast, but mm. we're more Midwest, Midwest okay. kind of people. Um, but where were we? Well, you're in Pittsburgh and you said all the top guys there. Oh, yeah. So and they're very funny and they're great. And I would travel and I would do bars in West Virginia. And but I think a lot of the times they didn't change their material. And I think it's different now. Yeah. Um, But I just performed back in Pittsburgh and I noticed here like I worked really hard to unpolish my set when okay. I got to Los Angeles to where it was. And what does that mean like to unpolish it? So where sometimes it feels like you're pressing play and it's like, and I always say uh-huh. like that. And I know that when I got here to Los Angeles, 
I was doing my best stuff and I was confident with my best stuff, but I wasn't getting anything. Like I wasn't, I'd go to flappers and I'd do really well at flappers every time. And I emceed Mark Eddy, took me oh, to MC cool, yeah. for Mar- for them. And so then that was like it. adding new tags kind of? And like no, I would try to make it look like I'm talking to you more. Oh, okay. So whether it's, a, uh, and it would just be less rehearsed. But blah, 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 blah would become, and then I went to the, da, da, da. Right. Like it, or I don't know how to put it into words, but I would, it makes, like I look like I'm thinking more. Right. And I am thinking more. Yeah. I'd be so more relaxed. more in the moment. Yes. Perfect. Oh, more in the moment. That's so cool. Yeah. Because I feel like, yeah, some of my jokes, like I'm just, you know, like you said, press play and yeah. it's just going. And that's the worst thing when you go to open mics or individually produced shows here. You look like such a tool when you're doing clubby. Like, not that it's it's bad comedy, but it, it's, that it's polished. It's very old-fashioned, I guess, yeah. It is now. I think it, that's a perfect word, that yeah. it is old-fashioned now versus you go to the Laugh Factory or the Comedy Store and people appear to be just spitting words into the microphone and yeah. they're funny. <laughs> and like that's, So that's not my style, but I don't want you to think I'm pressing play. Right. And so, I mean, your writing process, you're, you're writing all these jokes and you're unpolishing them too. Yeah. So how, how is your writing process? Do you write every day or do you journal? Or? I wish I had more of a writing process. Yeah. So I have like a bag filled with notes. I'm still very old school paper and pen. Yep. Um, but so then whenever I think, I'll think of a premise and then I'll sit down and um, I do an eight minute rule where it's because it's so easy to get distracted with everything. Yeah. So I'll have the premise and I'll write for six seconds and then get on Facebook. So I will sometimes just turn off my internet so that nobody's popping up. Right. And then I have to focus for eight minutes. <laughs> so then I'm like, and something comes usually. Right. But so I'll set my timer for eight minutes and I sit there and I hammer out the idea or I just sit there, but I have to think about just that premise for eight minutes. And that's oh. sort of been, that's a relatively new, like maybe within the last year. And it's been really helpful? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, like it's like, oh, I just wrote a joke. Like instead <laughs> of before a joke would come out of just me daydreaming while I'm driving or right. me saying something like funny to a friend. Yeah. 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 That's so, yeah, just sit there. That makes so much, in short spurts too, because I, I can't sit. For, I know people like sit for two hours. I'm right. Like, How do they do that? Like. Right. Well, I might sit there. I, I don't. I don't think I sit there for two hours, but there, there should be more than one eight minute inter- right. interval. Right. Yeah. But I, when I, like I, started working out and this guy and I was trying to run and I had never done anything like that. And he was like, once you can run for eight minutes, you can run forever. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where the magic eight minutes. Yeah. And he was right. Like when I started running, once I got to eight minutes, then the world opened up and it was like, okay, I can run. Yeah. And same with comedy. Then once I get to eight minutes, then it's like, oh, I have more ideas about this right. bit. Yeah. Have you seen Kimmy Schmidt yet? That show? Oh, I loved it. Yeah. Uh-huh. If you can handle anything for 10 seconds. You oh, can yeah. Handle anything. yeah. I did think that's great. <laughs> no, one, I remember two, watching that. Yeah. <laughs> Crank in the crank for right, 10 exactly. seconds over and over. <laughs> it's a new thing every 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah. That's a great method. Yeah. I love that. I'm going to try that this time. Yeah. And so you come to San Francisco and your day job is, is it still related to art? No. So art, art lasted about a year, okay. two years. And then I went to, and then I was so miserable and so poor and so sad as an individual and a human being and in debt and just miserable. And I always think it's an underplayed stage in life, like your quarter life crisis where it's like you're supposed the whole world is supposed to be yours. And you're like, oh my God, do I have to do this until I retire? Like, is that the next thing I have to look forward to is like waking up every day and watching (laughs) Good Morning America while I dry my hair and... Driving in traffic, it was, I couldn't, oh. right. and and I didn't really see anything else at all, and I wasn't in a relationship, like, it just was a very dark yeah. time, and so then I just had to get a new job, I had to make more money, and I literally would, if I drove anywhere, if I drove and I saw a billboard, I'd write down the company on the billboard, if I saw a truck drive by, I'd write down whatever the company of the truck, and my family and I, which we never, this is another universe we never do things like this, yeah. but for the 4th of July, we went to dinner on the top of Mount Washington, which overlooks the city. Oh, wow. But it was, it's like to this fancy restaurant. Yeah. Never do we do that, ever. <laughs> and there was this building, because we were looking at the skyline, and I wrote down the name of the top of the building, which was Free Markets. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and I sent in a resume to be an administrative assistant, because yeah. I had no other skills. And, and I, I think in my interview, I even had like sorority pamphlets. Like that's kind of what I was bringing right. to the table here. <laughs> <laughs> Planned a sorority banquet five years ago or Tried something. Delta. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> I can chant at the interview. 
<laughs> but, uh, and, and then, and so 200 people applied for that administrative assistant job. Oh my God. And I got, and I, at the very bottom, I put that I did stand up comedy because I had no skills. So yeah. I just wanted to put something that set me apart. And that's the reason I got the interview. Oh my God. And I still keep in touch with the woman that hired me. Really? And we had lunch <laughs> not too long ago. What was the interview? Did she like tell me a joke or was it like? She just was so amazed that I did that. And wow. I'd only done it once, well, keep in mind, like at the yeah. bar and grill. Mm -hmm. And so I had to pretend, yes, this is what I do. And I take a class and like, talk I just got it off up. The road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm exhausted. I'm a road warrior, they call me. <laughs> but just that. Uh, and she said, and I met with her. So she's also quit corporate America. She was very fancy. Wow, yeah. Quit corporate America to write a screenplay. So she inside of her just oh so she related to that yeah right whether she knew it at the time or not right. this is many years ago and um but she told me when we had lunch a year ago she was like i knew from that moment you were going to get hired because she, it was a team full of women mm -hmm. and uh do you have a day job with like what is your do you well, have a, mine doesn't really count because it's like with my dad so. okay okay <laughs> No stakes to be lost. <laughs> so I don't know if you've ever worked with a bunch of women, uh -huh. but it can be very emotional. It can be very catty. And so she said, I had a very high, it was all women and it was a very high emotive team and I needed someone to lighten it up. So oh, the wow, fact that I did so comedy, great, yeah. yeah, I had the job, but it took forever and I'm dying <laughs> at this point. Like I'm so miserable at the museum. Like, please God, I would cry. It was horrible. And, um, and I, rem oh, yeah. and I remember driving to work one day and hearing this song. It's by Jimmy Eat World. And it's like, it takes some time, little oh. girl, you little. And I had to pull over the car because I was weeping. Like, oh. like, like, everything will be all right. And I've often thought of, like, if this Rachel could just tell that Rachel, like, it it's really is going to get so yeah. much better. <laughs> but isn't, I feel like that is really the best, like, way to go about i mean because there are like two three kids who end up with that like you know six figure job or whatever like right out of college and you're like oh i hate those kids yeah but then to eventually be like you know at the improv and laugh factory like you yeah. are like that's the ultimate dream i feel like like well um i don't know i believe in I manifesting mean, and visualizing work along the way and a lot of pain a right. lot of blood sweat and tears but i remember like i always that's kind of what i fantasized about like i saw working girl when i was a little kid and like that's what you do you start with nothing right. and you work your ass off and i guess that's what happened but uh but boy it would have been a lot better if i would have known like if somebody would have tapped me on the shoulder which i'm sure people did and yeah. said major in finance like major <laughs> major in something you can make money and like like do you have a skill All right um but i think thank god i didn't uh because the people that had trades like their salaries i feel like all capped out like exactly. you, you, yeah. yeah like what are those guys doing now You're, but like, when i was making 20 comma five thousand dollars a year <laughs> out of 500 000, 20 000, comma 500 I sure would have liked to have had a trade and right. I just, there was no hope in the world <laughs> for me. <laughs> and, th and that's, so when I had my interview, I met with Lori and I met with the team and, and I, everybody was in jeans and sweaters or sweatshirts. Yeah. And I was like, well, this is, I'd never known this world. And they had beer Fridays and a Slurpee oh, machine awesome, yeah. and all these <laughs> neat things. And then I had to wait for the VP and the VP uh, was like in South America doing very fancy, brilliant things. And I was going to be a little bit of his assistant, mostly Lori's assistant. And so it was months, like, I don't know. It felt like months, but it was <laughs> many weeks before finally I got to interview with him. And my heart was just set on this place. I had to work at this job. And when he's interviewing me and he's very handsome, I think he was 28 at the time and yeah. I'm 22, but he looked like Anderson Cooper, like he had gray <laughs> hair and like steel blue eyes and he was so smart and I'd never met a man like that yeah. that was young. And, and, and he said, well, so tell me why you want this job. And honest to God, my eyes filled up with tears. Like, <laughs> like you know, that involuntary. And he like very graciously got up and looked out the window and was like, oh, there's the Warhol Museum. Like you, you like gave me a second to collect myself. Oh. And then how, how are you not going to hire Wait, me? Why point at the Warhol Museum? Though? That's where I interned. <laughs> oh, okay. So he looked at like and that. Don't I just, bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I loved my internship. Yeah. But that's so it was like, because that was on my resume right. next to can make doilies, <laughs> like, origami, whatever else. <laughs> Please, God, hire me. And uh, yeah.
And so I cried in my interview. Why do you want this job? That's so... It's a good question. Oh, that's so hard, though. (laughs) It's enthusiasm. That's true. Like, that's all what I tell everybody. Like, just go in enthusiastic. Right. I'm going to, like, please save me. Like, who else is going to work harder than the girl that cries? True. Absolutely. Right? Like, give that girl a job. Yeah. Yeah. So so, so you're kind of in this... It's, like, a corporate Mm -hmm. business kind of Mm -hmm. setting? Yep. So, and it was a job I didn't really understand at all. They did online auctions for procurement professionals. Okay. And we're going to spend the next 40 minutes of this uh, <laughs> podcast about talking about, about procurement. <laughs> well, I mean, is it something basic? That no, like, not really. It's really complicated. So, like, when big, big companies want to buy, like, they have a trucking fleet and they need to buy 40 million tires, which is, oh, okay. my numbers are way yeah. off. But then we would go and facilitate and invite all the people that make those tires And then they would bid on an online auction. And it was a really new, yeah, the guys that started the company, like nobody, they were Harvard grads um, that moved to Pittsburgh because we had a good airport. Like it was just, and so nobody had thought of that before. Uh, So people hated it, but it was fun. So I, at first was an admin, and then they moved me up to where I was facilitating these. And I'm talking to suppliers, and I didn't know any. uh, Electronics (laughs) was my specialty. (laughs) And I remember being on a call once and asking my client, how they wanted to list the chassis and the engineer like standing up, waving his arms on the conference call, like it's a chassis, it's a chassis. <laughs> but that's as much as I want to talk about. Yeah. That. I love that one joke you do where it's like, you do all the terms. Yeah. Like just like, just trying to get through. <laughs> yeah. When that's, I'm real proud of like, that's like that joke to me. I'm real proud of it's it. Like that was like, joke. I wrote that oh, joke gosh. and practiced that joke. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you just throw out jargon. And and so this is many years later. So I went from an admin to someone on the sales side. And but it was never my core. Like I never I didn't have that finance degree. And at that level, the people I worked with, they were their whole lives were to be that. Mm -hmm. And I did. So I didn't talk the language. I didn't understand. And I remember when I was leaving, I had to sit at a business dinner and there was a fan, one of the fancy guys in my company, like senior leadership, and he was talking with as much passion about what we do as you and I would talk about comedy. <laughs> and I just remember being like, oh, people do care about right. this, it's and I've got to get out. Other people care about like weird jobs. Where yes. It's like comedy is the only thing I feel like is important. To get passionate about, right. like to get passionate yeah. about <laughs> lean initiatives and whatever he was passionate about. And I was like, like laying wow. concrete. Like people love doing that, yeah. I guess. That's yeah. so cool. And that's so. Now, is comedy like a secret kind of? Is it like a thing no. you just do after work? Or no, my company kinda... was so incredibly supportive really? about, yeah. co- oh my God, because it was on my resume. Right. So there was one guy that he worked like on the cousin team of my team and he was this crazy big personality where like you'd walk, I don't know if he ever worked, there were just people surrounding him laughing their yeah. asses off. He was one of those guys. Just a funny guy in the So office. Yeah. funny. And so he, everybody's like, you have to meet Mark, you have to meet Mark. And so Mark and I became fast friends. Now, remember, I haven't done comedy for a year, year right. and a half, but everybody thinks I'm a comic. <laughs> and the Funny Bone did a competition. And uh, the competition, so I took a class somewhere along that year and a half. Then they do an amateur competition. And Mark and I, like, so stack the crowd. So the entire, and I didn't know that that was a thing, but the whole crowd is people from the office. Oh, my gosh. Uh, The president was there. Uh, Yeah. And they, oh, but it was, I mean, we were, I think you have to be delusional. Like I always think your first three years of comedy, you have to be delusional because you're so bad and you need to think that you're not. Yeah. And so we pretty much were rock stars. I came in third. He came in in second. Oh, that's awesome. And then a local guy that deserved it came in first. Wow. But part of winning that competition was we got to come back for the pro competition and work uh, do, um, we got to open, we got to do like three minutes, I think for the pro competition. And Mark and I were so funny. Like we were like, he was going to be on SNL. I was going to be in our heads. Like we were so, we were so talented that it was just a matter of minutes before we were discovered. Like that's what we, (laughs) and we really thought that. Yeah. And so (laughs) we didn't tell anybody. I mean, we didn't really need any help because we were so good. (laughs) So we had the the show and so the pro show and it's in a very crowded touristy place of Pittsburgh and there were um, like many events happening in that place so nobody could park and the club wasn't friendly to you. So like if you, you didn't make it, you're paying for your tickets. If oh. you're, yeah. So a lot of people didn't make it or their friend hadn't parked yet. Yeah. So they're like, so um, 
and it's snowing or something. I didn't think about my material. I didn't take any time to prep. I got this. I got yeah. this. <laughs> and I got up and it was nothing. Like, oh, And I was first. So third place went first. <laughs> and it was like, uh, and I just remember wanting the world to swallow me. Like, if oh, God, if just this stage could open up and I could be sucked down inside. And when I got off, somebody in the front row said to the host, so when are the real comedians coming up? Oh, and, I, no. <laughs> and I, and then Mark, who was still delusional, so he saw me die. <laughs> and he, I remember him like patting me on the shoulder like, oh, next time or oh, no. something. <laughs> so he was still cocky and then he got up and died just <laughs> as bad as I died. <laughs> And we were just like, and I remember when we did so well, the locals, like the comics that came to every Tuesday open mic mm -hmm. weren't nice. And I didn't understand why they weren't nice. Yeah. And now I see that we stacked the crowd. Like nobody had a chance. <laughs> and then I remember like, okay, right. Like it was one of those moments where it was like, I could never, ever do this again. And that would be fine. Like fine. Just never that feeling. Never. Yeah. yeah. So, oops, that was a mistake. <laughs> you had one great night. Right. <laughs> Let it go. But then I, so I made myself go to the open mic on Tuesday. And I remember those comics were so nice. Like, so really? it was, yeah. yep. So it was like, I put my, like, put my tail between my legs and walked in. Oh, and then I so became great. like yeah. a regular open micer and wow. did the work. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. But Mark never went back. <laughs> but he's still a star in his own world. Yeah. Like his world, he's a rock star, and that's a great place to be. I think Louis talked about that in his last special. He's like, I could have been like the funniest mechanic or something like his joke. Mm -hmm. He's like, why did I choose to be a comedian? He's well, like, that's something, especially so at this harder. level. <laughs> like whenever people are like, oh, everybody tells me that. Like you go to you do a show, right? And then some guy afterwards, like, everybody tells me I should be a comedian. And I find that so offensive because it's like, Mr. Like, it's the hardest then thing. be one. Exactly. <laughs> like, you have no idea. Like, it's one thing just cracking jokes. Right. But yeah, no, you couldn't, it's, Mr. Yeah. I had to look away from you when I said that. But yeah, it makes me so. And then you just smile like, oh, right. yeah. <laughs> There's not a two drink minimum in the workplace. Yeah. So people yeah. aren't upset. And for then they tell you the terrible money. jokes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. So. Uh, how long were you in San Francisco before you five came? years five years? Yeah to the day I left to the day. Yep, I moved five years to the day that and I got you were there. playing punchline and Cobbs. I and got to punchline finally Sweet. And then I left I did the same thing in Pittsburgh Like I finally got to probably be at the feature level at the improv yeah. and I was like leaving Oh, <laughs> and then I did the same thing. I got close to hosting um, What was the thing that made you want to come to LA? Was there anything in particular or I think I just had to it was yeah. well No, that's not fair. I guess my friends, like my did a lot of your comic friends. Go to I LA? think socially I hung out with when I moved to San Francisco, I had like a little community of people that I went to high school with, like not my core party group or uh, like high school friends, but yeah. they were people I knew and they lived together and I went to visit and this is another, the universe opens up. Like this was kind of right when the secret was coming out, right. but I didn't know about the secret. And I had, so I had pictures of San Francisco. Like I'd spent a weekend cause my, I'm sorry, my company bought, the company I worked for in Pittsburgh, a company in Sunnyvale bought that company. Oh, okay. And then I started going out there. Okay. And that's yeah. when it was like, oh, I could, like, people are nice here. And, like, at this point I was teaching software, so I traveled to all these right. different states. And it was like, oh, I could live here. I could fit in here. And, and then I just loved San Francisco. And one day... Felice, one of my friends that I stayed with, called and she was like, hey, uh, we'll move into a bigger place if you want to come here. And I hadn't asked her. Yeah. I hadn't. And it was like, yes. So she <laughs> didn't talk to any of the other roommates. So those poor fools had to pack up. <laughs> but they moved into a bigger place. Wow. Um, my salary was a Pittsburgh salary. And there was a girl at work who I found very annoying. She was very nice, but she was up my ass about asking for more money. And I didn't have confidence to do that. And I reasoned it in the negative, like, well, I mean, they'll just pay, because her thought was, they're going to be flying you. Right. They spend so much money to fly you to Sunnyvale. Why not pay you that money and you live there? Right. But they would fly me to send me back to Pittsburgh. So I, just to shut her up, a lot of my <laughs> stuff has been just so people would get off my ass. Right. <laughs> so just to shut her up, I made a spreadsheet and I mentioned it to my boss, like, hey, listen, all the people that I knew from the Pittsburgh office that moved to Sunnyvale nobody works for our company anymore so they've all found sunnyvale jobs and i and my and i'm gonna do that and it would be nice if you'd help and the yeah. the whole policy is hands down we do not help you move you can live anywhere you want but that's up to you and so um but i did this and so he took it seriously and he was like all right um and he 
mentioned it and he was like he called me later he's like Rachel I don't know who you know which was no one <laughs> he's like but uh when I mentioned this so they, the vice president who I'd never met gave me a 40 percent increase oh my god uh-huh and then they asked I wanted moving help like to help me move and um but I asked for like the like 1500 dollars to move all my stuff yeah. <laughs> across the country and the vice president was like that's not enough then doubled it Oh, um, awesome. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like that's where it's like the, the secret. Like I, right. That's happened to me a lot in my career. And it's like where stuff is just handed. Like when the timing is right, things just absolutely just are handed to me. Yeah. Yep. But so, that, so it's the, the business seeing it from the restaurant on the on yeah. Washington mountain and then uh -huh. the improv seeing Mark Eddy's name on that uh -huh. and now asking for the helping with moving. Well, picking so with Mark Eddy at the beginning, it was me picking the absolute last weekend because I didn't want right, to do exactly. it. That's Mark Eddy. All these things. I love uh -huh. that. It's so awesome. Uh huh. And then, uh, yeah. And so then they moved me out there. So that's how I got to San Francisco. Then all of my friends Sorry. that I was, uh, like my, my party friends, San Francisco is a big party time for yeah. me. And I had two best guy friends and they were both married and they were just my best friends to go boozing with and their wives got pregnant within like two months of each other oh. and kind of ruined my life like, <laughs> like that was everything was destroyed so that's that was when like life just got really boring they had to be home at certain times that where that joke came from too the, the I, I did a lot of jokes about my partner in crime yeah that was, that like, was oh. michael my partner in crime i make in the joke i make it a woman just so it doesn't right. so it's a little easier to understand but yeah my partner in crime and uh so then it was like, well, this isn't fun. And when, when your friends have babies, it's wonderful. But then all you're doing is sitting in their living rooms. Watching the baby. <laughs> well, yeah, playing with the baby. And, and it just, it just. It's too much. Yeah. So then you, and you I was move. single. And I'm like, I'm not going to meet anybody right. sitting in Michael's living room. <laughs> <laughs> and then you came to LA. Yeah. So work. And I, so I finagled it with my job Perfect. to move me to Los Angeles. And that worked the same, same thing. Like where it just fell out of the sky. Yeah. Like. I got the tip about something before and like just because I ran into somebody at the airport like my boss couldn't come so the guy that filled in told me information that I shouldn't <laughs> have had that allowed me to strategic like get a strategy and say like hey I give me the LA accounts move me and to LA everything just felt awesome. everything just the world yeah the yeah. street just opened up and I drove on wow. it yeah and how long have you been doing stand up here in LA for so probably three years three years oh mm -hmm. so cool yeah and the other night you were with Tim Allen, right? Yeah. At the Laugh Factory. Yeah. Did that? you go to that show? No, I wanted to. Oh, okay. I saw the, your name though. It was so cool. And Teron was there too, right? He does the 10 o'clock. Oh, okay. So that's, he's there every, what was How Thursday was night at 10? Performing at the Laugh Factory. Spectacular. Yeah. Just spectacular. So, so cool. it went great. Like it went, and this was like his, Tim's manager. So getting into the Laugh Factory, as I'm sure you know, is very hard. Mm. It's very hard to get noticed here. And when I first moved here, I did the like stood in line. At the comedy store, like on well, the, at the Flaff Factory, like at right. Tuesday, and you get oh, there yeah. at three. Just and in I, the sun. Yeah, yeah. And I thought I did really well, but nothing came of it. And uh, so I was like, boy. And then I worked with Dom Herrera, and that's his home club. Yeah. And this is years ago, and I remember saying, like, well, Dom, like, how do you get in there? And he's like, you have to be so good, you're undeniable. Wow. And I thought, okay. Yeah. And that was when I was having the realization, like, what I'm doing isn't good enough. Like, I'm proud of it, I like it, mm -hmm. but it's not good enough. Right. So that's when I kind of pulled away from the clubs and like flappers and the ice house and started doing independent rooms and like, at, like getting on those shows where I look like an idiot when I'm bah, 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 bah. <laughs> right. So I had to be less polished. Right. And then I wrote like a whole new, probably like 15, 20 minutes oh, that wow, I was really yeah. proud of. And, uh, and I felt like that, that was good enough. Yeah. Um, but so then Tim Allen's manager, when they gave me the booking, said to the Laugh Factory, you have to let her get up on the stage a couple times so she can get comfortable. Okay. And I selfishly just took it as sweet. Yeah. Like, I'm in at the Laugh Factory. <laughs> <laughs> so good, I'm undeniable. <laughs> but I realized, like, I re that was such a brilliant move on his part yeah. because the stage is so different and so intimate. Like, here we go. We're now we're at, like, every time you t step up a rung, you realize how far you have to climb. Right. And so I had just come back from Roosters. Roosters, I consider my home club. Yeah. I was annihilated. I did so well at Roosters. <laughs> and then I do like a Tuesday at the Laugh Factory and it's it like my, again. yeah, my yeah. dead laugh, like my for sure fire stuff was getting chuckles oh. and the crowd was nice. So yeah. it wasn't the crowd's fault. It was my fault. 
but it was my head wasn't at all in my set. So like I was, I was thinking more like, okay, I'm in the laugh factory. And, oh, is that Ari Shafir? Did he hear oh, that? Was that yeah. him laughing at that joke? Right. And I wonder who's in this crowd. Like, so I wasn't at all. It's a lot of, yeah. Yeah. And, popping up. Yeah. yeah. And so my boyfriend and I like got home and I was kind of defeated and I'm like, man, like at Roosters, I'm a rock star. <laughs> and so he would start texting me before my laugh factory, like rooster it. Rooster. <laughs> so I would get on the stage and be like, you're at root, like with the confidence that I would walk on rooster stage and know these people are going to love me. And then it made a huge difference. Wow. Like, and not pay attention. Like, is that Neil Brennan? Uh, yeah. I think he'll like that joke. Do that joke. <laughs> like that kind of right. stupid stuff that we're not stupid, but that's so cool though. Yeah. Yeah. I had to like, yeah, I had to borrow the confidence rooster that I have. It. I had to rooster yeah. it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for talking. Oh, this is so too. fun. Thank this you. is so I fun. Really Thank it. you. Thank no, you. I, yeah. I'm honored that you asked and I'm, and it went really fast. Thank you. And where can we see you? Are you playing any shows this week? So now I'm doing like groundling stuff. So now I'm okay. working with the improv team. Um, so comedy, the summer wise, stand up wise, I'm going to do the same thing. Like I'm falling back from booked shows and just doing, I'm going to try and write More some new material. And... Yeah, voiceover is a thing that I'm okay, working cool. on. Awesome. And building content for my website, rachelmcdowell.com. Um, and yeah, so now it's like Groundlings. Now I'm doing student student Sweet. shows. That's this awesome. Friday I have one. We have a couple scheduled in the next couple months. I have to come to your shows then. I'm always yeah. there. I would love it. And all my shows are on my website. Great. Okay. Thank you so Thank much, Thank you. I, this is so great. Thank this you is so, so much. Great. It was nice meeting you. Thank you. You too. <laughs>